Moving on to number three here. This is the relationship between somatic symptom burden and negative affect expectation. So whether people with a high somatic symptom burden had worse expectations of negative affect compared to those with a low somatic symptom burden. And the analysis we were going to use for this particular test is our independent samples t-test. And we've got four assumptions for our independent samples t-test. Our assumption of independence we know is met through our sampling design, just like it has been for all the other tests that we've just run. And we know that our dependent variable is on a numeric scale. This is our negative affect expectation variable. And we know that just by understanding the variable itself. So the only two that we need to test is the normal distribution of negative affect within our two groups and that the variation or the spread of scores in negative affect is equal between the two groups. So let's start with the normal distribution. So we can get our histogram of our negative affect expectancy scores between the two different groups because the expectation of the normality of this distribution applies to the negative affect scores for the low mild group and also separately the, nest, the distribution of negative affect scores for the moderate severe group. So you have to look at them, the distribution separately according to the groups or the categories of your independent variable. So looking at these two histograms, we can see that both of them look approximately normally distributed. They both look similar-ish to what a normal distribution would look like. And we can use that Shapiro-Wilk test to help us kind of, kind of help interpret these particular histograms. And what we can see here is that both of these Shapiro-Wilk tests are non-significant. The p-values are both bigger than 0.05, which is consistent with these distributions being normal. It's consistent with a normal distribution. So we can say that that assumption is met. And then our last assumption, the variance of our dependent variable is equal between the two different groups. We can check by using Levine's test of equality of variances. And that's on our next slide here. So this is our output from Levine's test. Um, this test we talked about back in the independent samples t-test week a few weeks ago. Um, and this, is, this particular test is helping us to interpret this assumption of whether the spread of scores or the variation of scores, in this case negative affect scores, is approximately even between the two different groups. So what we can see in the table up the top here is that the standard deviations are quite similar between the two groups, which is good, standard deviations being a measure of the spread of scores or the variability of scores. But we can use this first row of statistical results here as interpretation of the actual statistical test itself. So this is the results from Levine's test. And on the right hand side here is the p-value that corresponds with Levine's test. And just like the Shapiro-Wilk test, what we want here is a non-significant p-value. Because a non-significant p-value, a p-value bigger than 0.05, means that this assumption is met. If the p-value was less than 0.05, it would mean that the variations or the spread of scores are different between the two groups, and that's not what we want. So here we've got a non-significant Levine's test, which is great, which means that we do have that assumption met. The assumption of equality of variances between the two groups is met. Which again means that all four of our assumptions are ticked off, so we can actually proceed with the independent samples t-test itself. So this is our output from our independent samples t-test. You can see that we're comparing the mean um, negative affect scores between our two different groups. And just by looking at the descriptive statistics up the top here, you can see that the low mild somatic symptom burden group do have a lower um, negative affect score compared to the moderate severe somatic symptom burden group who have a higher negative affect score, higher mean negative affect score. And by looking at the t-statistic results down the bottom here and the corresponding p-value, we can see that because the p-value is less than 0.05, that means that there's a statistically significant difference between the negative affect scores compared to the low mild somatic symptom burden group and the moderate severe somatic symptom burden group. So we can conclude that individuals with moderate to severe somatic symptom burden have significantly more negative expectations of the pain task than individuals with low to mild somatic symptom burden. And that's quoting the t-statistic and the p-value there. So what that means is that high somatic symptom burden individuals' negative expectations were higher than individuals with low somatic symptom burden expectations. And we can interpret the actual difference between the two means in terms of the point difference 
or turn that into a percentage and talk about a percentage difference to be able to get a sense of how big that difference was, how substantial the difference was. So I've said here that high somatic symptom burden individuals' negative expectations were on average about one point higher, which is almost 10% higher than those with low SSB. Remember that one point is on, the, on an 11 point scale. So the scale ranges from zero to 10, so it's an 11 point scale. So one out of 11 corresponds with almost a 10% difference. And that's giving us an idea of how big the difference is or how substantial the difference is. And that means that our hypothesis was supported here. That's exactly what we predicted would happen. On to our last hypothesis here, and this is looking at the experimental induction of mindfulness and whether that changes people's experience of negative affect after the task itself. And this is just like the previous one, also addressed with an independent samples t-test. So same four assumptions as we had just on the previous example. We know that our dependent variable, negative affect experience, is on a numeric scale. We know that our observations are independent because we understand how the data was sampled. And in order to check the normality of the distribution of negative affect experience, we just need to do the same thing that we did previously. So here's a histogram of looking at negative affect two between our two different groups. And we can see that for both of these two groups, the distributions are approximately normal. Again, they're not perfect, they're a little bit wonky looking, but real data often look like this and it can still be consistent with a normal distribution, even if it looks a little bit wonky. So look at our histograms and look at our Shapiro-Wilk test um, results in order to help us with that interpretation. And you can see that both of the p-values for the Shapiro-Wilk tests are non-significant. Uh, yeah, are non-significant. So both of those p-values are bigger than 0.05, which is good. It's a non-significant result, which means that both of these distributions are consistent with a normal distribution. So that assumption is met. And then our, our last assumption that we need to check, the equality of the variances, we can do just like the previous one with Levine's test. So here we have the results from Levine's test. So testing the distribution of negative affect two scores between the two groups and specifically seeing if the variation or the spread of scores is approximately the same between the two groups. And just like before, you can see by actually looking at the standard deviations, you can see that they're very, very similar between the mind wandering and the mindfulness groups, which is good. And looking at the actual results of the Levine's test itself, we can see that the p-value is non-significant, 0.8, which is much bigger than 0.05, which is great, which is consistent with that assumption being met. So we can say that that assumption of equality of variances is met and therefore all four of our assumptions are met and we can proceed to our final independent samples t-test. So here's our t-test output and looking at the two means here we can see that the average negative affect experience scores are higher in the control group, the mind wandering group, compared to the mindfulness group. They do seem to be lower in the mindfulness group. Looking at our actual t-statistic down the bottom here and the p-value, we can see that we have a significant result, our p-value being less than 0.05, and therefore we can say that the two mean scores are significantly different, and further than that, the mindfulness group have significantly lower negative affect experiences compared to the mind-wandering group. So mindfulness, the mindfulness induction resulted in significantly lower negative experience of the pain task compared to the control induction and quote our t test results and p-value there. And we can also have that measure of effect size by again talking about how big the difference between the two groups is. So again, it's a slightly bigger than one point difference. It's a 1.3 point difference, in fact. And 1.3 out of 11 gives us about a 12% increase or a bit, a bit bigger than 10%. So I've said here that a mindful state, a mindful state of mind resulted in more than 10% reduction in negative experience, negative affect experience compared to control. And that's our measure of how big the effect is. And again, that supports our hypothesis. So we predicted that the mindfulness induction would result in people having a less negative experience. And that's exactly what our results have shown.